Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to the No-Till Market Garden Podcast, episode 20. Today on the podcast, we go deep into the south with Kyle Platt of Bodock Farm in Alabama to talk about the nearly seven-acre plot he's managing in No-Till, about the land trust that Bodock is a part of, and uh, a whole lot more. Really loved this conversation as Platt is doing market garden style on pretty sizable acreage. So uh, a lot of insight in this episode. But we couldn't bring it to you without you. If you have not become a patron yet, but are gaining a ton of value out of this podcast, please consider kicking in a few dollars over at our Patreon page. That's patreon.com slash Farmer Jesse. We need to get that up to $1,000 a month by May to afford a second season of this podcast. I wish I were bluffing. I've been spending my family money to get this thing running, and we're cool with that. That's Hannah and my dedication to aggregating this information. But... I cannot afford to do it that way again. So please consider signing up at patreon.com slash farmer Jesse. You can also Venmo us a donation at no-till growers or PayPal or send a check or whatever. You rock. And you know who else rocks? Our sponsors. This show is generously supported by Growing for Market magazine. For 28 years, Growing for Market has been the source for direct food and flower growers. All GFM content is custom written for the magazine by farmers like myself and others who get their hands dirty and know what they're doing. They do not recycle content that you've seen elsewhere. It is a consistently good magazine. If you do farmer's market, CSA, farm stand, pick your own florist sales, or wholesaling, your business is different from any other kind of farming. Whether you're a commercial grower or just want to grow like one, subscribe to GFM for the nitty gritty of growing marketing and the business of small farming 10 times a year. Available as a paper magazine, digital download, or both. Subscribe to GFM for the latest on market farming. There's information on growing vegetables and flowers in every magazine. And I will add, lots of good no-till articles. Use the coupon code NOTILL to get 20% off any subscription through growingformarket.com or call 800-307-8949. Subscribers always get 20% off the carefully curated selection of market farming books GFM carries, including podcast guest and GFM editor Andrew Mefford's brand new book, The Organic No-Till Farming Revolution, where Mefford interviews 17 different growers using no-till and gives an overview of the techniques, providing a roadmap for anyone interested in starting a no-till farm or converting an existing one to no or less tillage. That's growingformarket.com. Offer code no-till, lowercase, no hyphen. All right. Enough for me. Let's get to our interview with Kyle Platt of Bodock Farm. Kyle Platt, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. Absolutely, man. Can you, maybe I thought we could just start with you, uh, you know, telling us a little bit about Bodock and uh, where you're located and how much land is under cultivation there. Yeah, so Bodock Farm, uh, it isn't a trust. It's about the larger farm itself is 6,000 acres. Uh, 4,500 is contiguous. Most of that land is in grass-fed uh, regenerative beef, which is probably a whole podcast in itself. And then we've carved out our little 7 to 10 acre chunk uh, that is what we call the market garden. And that has been in production uh, since this last January. So we're really just coming up on a year anniversary of actual cultivation, production, selling. Um, and then a year prior to that uh, was focused on some specialty crops uh, and then, you know, setting up to what we are today, which we had kind of different non-till or we had different uh, maybe tilling uh, aspirations in the beginning. And uh, quickly came to realize with our Black Prairie soil, uh, we were going to switch to a no-till system. Interesting. Can you tell us a little bit ab- about how that trust works? Yeah. So the trust, um, you know, just very generally, it's it's uh, a wealthy investor that is in based out of Virginia, and he purchased this land. Uh, if you are familiar with this part of the of Alabama, which I'm sure many people aren't. Uh, it's heavy cotton, corn, you know, just conventional row croppers. And so this land, as I take it, was purchased to keep that out of production like that. Um, so very environmentally minded. And um, yeah, and that's where the, the grass fed beef comes in. We also have lambs, chickens. Um, and then I came on two years ago uh, to, to do the market garden side, uh, which was in line with uh, the larger, I guess you could like the organic umbrella. Um, 
sort of motivations that they have here. Sure. And so you're not managing that livestock operation? No, I'm only in charge of the seven to 10 acres, although just through osmosis, I do pick up uh, bits and pieces about, um, you know, the regenerative side of the, the, the protein, the animal side, which uh, definitely currently co-aligns with what we're doing. And then where are you all and how are you all distributing the, the produce? Yeah, so um, we have our first year out, we had about a 50 member, 50, 50 member uh, CSA. And that was to members in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham, uh, primarily in Birmingham right now. That's really a, an, an interesting food scene, not only with restaurants, but also kind of a rising foodie scene there. Um, and then we also serve currently about 10 restaurants um, and that, that farm to table scene in Birmingham is, is really interesting. Anthony Zimmer, Zimmerman came out recently and filmed some shows for Food Network and uh, called Birmingham kind of a, a food hotspot in the U.S. right now. And we definitely feel that way with the restaurants we serve and the restaurants that we you know, have potential to work with in the future. It's really great. Um, and then we also do two markets now. We do a market in Tuscaloosa, which is year-round, and then we just got into a market at Pepper Place, which is kind of a, a really great market in Birmingham. And, uh, yeah, that's our outlets right now. Nice. Yeah, I'm definitely hearing more and more good things about that area uh, in the culinary scene. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? How did you come to find Bodak and, and get involved with this? Yeah, so um, about seven, eight years ago, I got into agriculture, spending some time overseas, uh, kind of dealing with some pollution, um, and then wanting to do something about that coming back to the United States. So I did a two-year apprenticeship on a, a UPIC farm. Uh, shout out to Sundew Gardens in Florida. Incredible operation. And not only did I learn a lot, but just the passion. I left with a whole lot of passion to continue to do it myself. Um, my wife and I, my two boys, we ended up in Alabama four years ago, four and a half years ago, something like that. No, it'd be four years ago now, the age of my, my first son. And um, I worked at another uh, farm and local farm in the area and learned a whole bunch, had a great experience there. And then the last two years I've been at this farm. Uh, and like I said previously, I came to this farm with, uh, you know, a lot of tillage experience, so to say, and a lot of efficient tractor methods and, and whatnot. And so the way we came to no-till on this farm is uh, an interesting story. Yeah, I want to hear it. So so what? how did that come about? How did you kind of transition from being tractor tillage mindset to no-till? Um, so, you know, initially it was coming to this farm uh, and the knowledge I had, I, you know, immediately set out, started working the land, disking, uh, tilling for that chocolate cake effect. Uh, and it's just black prairie soil does not, does not uh, work with you with something like that. And so I was very much by myself for the first year um, trying to develop this, this vegetable market garden vegetable operation, which none had existed prior to me coming on board. It was always in animals. Um, and when I did that, um, I quickly realized through a whole lot of trial and error blood, sweat, and literal tears that it just wasn't working. And so it still wasn't till later where I had an intern that came on board. You know, as I grew, I needed more help. And he had been uh, looking into Jean Martin's uh, book. And I think, uh, I don't know that his master class, gardener class had come on at that time, but I had never um, heard of Jean Martin and to, to kind of being slowly every couple weeks more and more my intern telling me about the way that they farmed it, it just seemed to click with the failures we had tilling you know we would we would pull beds and those beds were just clotty as could be and it didn't matter if I had 19 lines which of course I only had one or two drip lines ever on the bed so what the water does in our soil is it just drips straight down um, kind of hits the hard pan and then drips out the side of the beds and it just wasn't working. And 400 foot rows as we had set it up, 
uh, just does not work well with overhead irrigation, or at least the time it didn't. And so it was like a, a necessity thing, like, a, oh, my God, yes, this is going to 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 work our soil down and not have to till it anymore. And it was only later that, um, you know, shortly later, but um, a little bit later for sure that the the kind of soil health as a necessity, as a, as a builder of nutrient-dense food, of tastier vegetables, that, that came to play kind of as we became more successful, not killing the soil at a necessity um, to not pull our hair out. Nice. So can you describe kind of how you adapted JM's style and how did you have to reshape all your beds and, and all that sort of thing? Or did you kind of, how did that, how did that work? Yeah. So that first year, um, it was through my interns kind of reading and he was reading the book and simultaneously coming back and kind of telling me about these things. I don't know that I was apprehensive. I was just taken aback because it was so different from what we currently had set up. Our beds were running north and south. They were four or 500 feet long. Um, so we scratched all that. And I then kind of planned out how we were going to form these blocks, right? And 10 seemed to, to come naturally as a way to, to efficiently plan out those blocks and, and, you know, it's always thinking blocks or half blocks, quarter blocks. So that number came and then, you know, researching farmers friend LLC, having all sorts of awesome silage tarps. So that is very much a part of our system. Um, and so we did a whole lot more tillage and our philosophy was, and I, I really recommend this is that the initial tillage, um, could be essential, you know? So, um, for us, what we did is we just, this up the whole field again, and then we squared off. Uh, I think in in the first field we have 22 blocks. Most are full blocks, which is the blocks are 50 feet by 100 feet long, leaving us with 10 two and a half foot wide by 100 foot long beds in those blocks. And so after we got those blocks uh, squared up, you know, with one another, and then kind of down, you know, creating a checkerboard. Um, you know, when we left ourselves 20 foot wide roads, um, I guess you could say north and south and then east and west, we left ourselves with, uh, slightly slimmer roads, 10 foot wide. And so then after that, we, we pulled the beds. Once our, our blocks were squared up, we pulled, you know, the 220 beds or whatever it was in, in two days. And that would have been. Um, we would have done that actually last December. We had kind of a weird dry, dry spell. Um, and we got all that done and some of that we silage tarped right away. And then, um, some of that, we just, you know, immediately started kind of getting ready to prep. Uh, but that field, we've later explained, expanded into another field, adding another 15 of the same size blocks with the same philosophy of, uh, tilling first the entire, you know, that, that growing area and then squaring up and then forming the beds with the, with the very real goal of, of never tilling those blocks again. Cool. So you're doing seven acres in those blocks. Is that roughly correct? Yes. Um, wow. So the, the first field is three and a half acres uh, and Part of that field has three 30 by 100 foot long high tunnels. Uh, we've invested in some farmer's friend uh, cat tunnels, which, goodness, what a, a great thing to have for some of those early and late season crops. I personally love to put them in carrots as much as I can. Um, but, yeah, that, those, that, that acreage there, it's a whole lot to work with. And um, our team right now is myself and three full-time people and then uh, we have people trickle in sometimes from a, a local it's a place called horseshoe farm they do a lot of social work and um, amazing help that they come and you know maybe once a week once every other week they come and help us but it's the four of us full time um, and then the new field that we've recently developed with another 15 blocks uh, we put all of that immediately into cover crop after we uh, form those blocks you know, we form the, form the blocks, 
fold the beds and then immediately put it into like a, a spring summer cover crop. Uh, it had okra, it had uh, sorghum Sudan, it had uh, I think a pea of sorts, or no, excuse me, it was a uh, it was a, a bean of sorts, and that that stayed that way. So you know that we didn't leave that soil barren. We knew we weren't going to plant it for a little bit. Um, so that would have been this last kind of mid springish um, that we had that already in cover crop, and then. Um, we put chickens through that. And so that's another part of our system that we're bringing on now uh, is animals and agriculture, which, you know, in many ways is essential for, for fertility. Um, and so what we did was is those blocks were in cover crop, and then we would pull the chickens through for a week at a time. And they were very young when we first started to put those 400 birds through. And so they would stay um, a lot I guess a week and a half at most, but now that they're, when they were full size birds in four days, they had cleared, you know, 50 by a hundred feet and left a whole lot of goodness coupled with the cover crop system there. And, and none of that was tilled, um, you know, for, for future use. Neat. That, I love that you use okra in your cover crops. That's like the most Southern thing I've ever heard. The, the, <laughs> the uh, okay. So then your basic, uh, you know, bed prep is, how does that work? Are you all putting down, like, uh, let's go to that, let's go to that where the chickens just were. What, what did you all do to prep that ground for planting? Great question. So I should note also that we experimented and let the chickens in when the cover crop was full, fully grown, and they were skittish. It was almost as if they were afraid of shadows and which is totally normal being afraid of their the predators flying overhead. But if we took the bush hog and we left about a foot, a foot and a half bush hogged it, then they were totally comfortable to to explore the whole block. And so that's what we did. We explored the whole block. Um or excuse me, we bush hogged it, they explored the whole block for a week. And then after they left, I would bush hog what any stubble that was left and that is just to ensure that um, nothing's going to poke through the silage tarping and so after you know the bed is this it doesn't have to be perfectly clean by any means just nothing that's going to poke through the silage tarp and we put that silage tarp over for it depends on what time of year it is that and, and, and how far out or um, you know we'll have to to prep another bed to plant it um, but for example, in the in the main field where we haven't had chickens yet, um, if we have head lettuce as an example in the whole block, that head lettuce, if I know that I want to turn it in two weeks because it's the summertime, what I'll do is is I'll um, go in and bush hog that um, that whatever is remaining, and we silage tarp it exactly two weeks every single time, and this is white side up in the summertime. It's white side up to keep that soil cooler. Um, we find that two weeks turns that soil back black, completely, completely black. And anything that's left can generally be raked out in minutes. One person can rake an entire block out in minutes. If it's That's how little is residual is left there. And so then if we were going to plant it right away, say we had a round of tomatoes going in behind the head lettuce, um, you know, or, or – purpose whatever it is um, our system is we do use alfalfa meal um, so we'll take buckets and then um, we'll put out that alfalfa meal on each bed and then we'll put out um, a little nature safe 855 and then we'll put out uh, compost on those beds and generally it's between six and ten buckets per per bed depending on uh, what's going in and what just came out and how much compost did it just receive. And then the only other thing that we would do to those beds would be a light, bright, broad forking. Um, and that would be uh, depending on when it was last broad forked. Of course, I'm sure I've heard other farmers on different podcasts, you know, talk about feeling the need to broad fork everything every time. And then we realized that we were killing ourselves. And so now it's more of um, a necessity than it is, uh, you know, you know or it's, it's more of doing it out of necessity than it is just doing it to do it every time. And once those beds are broad forked, 
um, a little bit of the compost, a little bit of the alfalfa, the fertilizer it falls in those cracks, and then we rake those beds out. And here, the, the biggest thing for us is um, we're only spending enough time raking for whatever is going into that transplant. We don't have to spend the time to rake it out perfectly and creating this bowling alley effect when it can be rather rough and just fine and we can, you know, throw in the, the seedlings, no problem. But obviously if a carrot planting or bed of arugula or um, any, any of the, the several things that we direct seed, if those are going in, then of course we can spend a little bit more time. And just a, a, a really important note here too, for us on the no-till system, so these beds are only a year old. I mean, the high tunnels would probably be the best soil we currently have on the farm. And that's that's right out a year, just a year and a few days now. And the transition we have seen in those beds, it's as if we're working with completely different soil now. You know, all the soil settles. Um, and when it settles like that, we haven't had to deal with any clotting whatsoever. Um, it's generally three crops coming out of a bed, you know, in a year. and all of a sudden we have this soil that's really nice to work with. You're not cutting your fingers with boulder, you know, planting into boulders. And the biggest thing, um, kind of a testament to the no-till system, at least on our farm, is we rarely cultivate anymore. And that's not something I knew would happen. I don't ever remember reading about that or seeing someone tell me that, oh, goodness, you know, it's the, the cultivation is, is next to nothing now. And the reason is there's a term for it, and I always forget it, and of course I did today, um, but having that black side down, and it does the same thing white side down on the silage tarping on those blocks, it germinates all those weeds, and they get leggy, and then they end up composting back into the soil. So in two weeks, we've germinated every weed that's there. We're not inverting the soil to bring up new weeds. And so also, we're turning these beds so fast that there's no time for anything to flower. Um, I won't say that that's a hundred percent true at the time. There's sometimes things get away from us, but we have noticed that an entire, you know, previous experience of cultivation being just a, a behemoth of a job. It's something that we rarely, rarely do. Yeah. It's so interesting. I've noticed that same thing. We, you know, we do kind of a semi deep compost system on our farm and uh, it just, the weeds have kind of disappeared. And uh, I'm not saying that they're not around or I don't occasionally have to go out with a hoe, but what used to take me 15 minutes or 20 minutes a bed now takes me 15, 20 minutes for the garden. It's a very dramatic change. Though, so are you, when it comes to things like baby greens, are you, how are you getting those beds prepped? You said that you could leave them a little rough for the transplants, but then something like baby greens, what's that look like? So, you know, and this comes back to um, having so much acreage under the no-till system like that. There's often times where we have something that's under silage tarp, several blocks um, that have been there for longer than we had expected because we just hadn't had a chance to plant it or maybe five blocks went out at once and we're only planting a block a week, something like that. And so what we find the longer the block is under the silage tarp, the cleaner that bed is going to be after we take it off. And as I said before, what we've done is, is the, the structure of our soil has become much more grainy and you, the the to compare it before where it was just these golf balls to tennis ball sized chunks of black prairie heavy clay soil it's okb soil which is silty clay loam um really great soil to grow you know almost any vegetable um but you we have found that um kind of adding compost alfalfa meal um so to answer your question um, we always have a, a block that is sitting longer than we had planned. And therefore, when we go to prep it, the broad forking would be lighter. Um, I would really, I heard this on a, I think I read this on a Facebook post one time about a farmer that had heavy clay soil and to be careful about broad forking too deep too soon. Whereas other advice, even from some very professional farmers were saying, get that broad fork as deep as possible. So I highly recommend that, um, especially if you are going to 
plant something direct seeded with a jang or an earthway, that the shallower you broad fork, um, the less disruption that's going to happen, especially at the outset where those beds, at least in our soil, can be become very cloddy uh, even after they've settled. And so it would be a very light broad forking, and then there's this kind of zen-like mode you get into uh, when you have when when you kind of prepare this bowling alley to plant in. And it's not perfect. Um, we do we have a BCS, but I'm not happy with the way that it um, compacts the soil. And so that's another thing that we have found is that instead of walking back on the beds, broad forking is your you know broad forking the bed. Obviously, the broad fork is always ahead of you. You're, you're kind of bringing that broad fork back as you step back on the bed. Well, we found in our soil that that was compacting. And so then you would have to kind of go deeper into the soil and then push down on the broad fork more. And then you're bringing up more soil. You're disrupting that soil more. And so um, we actually broad fork at an angle so that we no longer step on the bed ever for any reason um, especially broad forking. And so that creates, that doesn't ever compact that soil uh, for us so that when we do plant direct seed, some of those things, we're not having these super hot, hard parts and then, oh, there's a soft part, that's perfect. And oh, oh, the jang just crashed. No, that, that doesn't happen anymore since we've stayed off those beds uh, and then just lighter broad forking. So it's, it's really about um, thinking about before you just go in and start prepping the bed, you know, what the heck is going to go here? Um, so, yeah. In what ways are you able to use that BCS? So um, the larger, just a step back here, the larger farm does have tractors. The only time we ever use a tractor would be to bush hog, which I, I know that there's BCS attachments to have that bush hog. For us, we just borrow the, the larger farm's tractor for 10 minutes and bush hog. And so when when we have found that the larger tractors the farm has to pull the beds initially is a huge time saver. And the reason I say that is because we initially would use the BCS with the, uh, oh, not the rototiller, but the one that throws the dirt up. Uh -huh, the rotary plow, yeah. Rotary plow, exactly. We use that. And man, I'll tell you what, it just took the time that that took for what we were trying to accomplish, it just was, it was a half a day affair for one person to just, just finish one block. And again, a lot of that I think has to do with our soil. Um, when it, when it, when it rains, it pours in our soil and um, that the compaction that existed before us coming on that rotary plow, the BCS just wasn't, wasn't there, but where I do envision the BCS for us in the future um, I'm not, I'm not as keen to have that kind of walking on the bed and then using the, oh goodness, I'm looking, looking for now what the other, the other implement that doesn't invert the soil, but it, it sort of mixes it really shallowly. Uh huh. The power harrow. Thank you. The power harrow. Um, I'm not keen on that, that implement again, just, just a soil thing here, um, or an opinion here, but, um, where I do envision it is. Uh, the flail, like a flail mower attachment, which I've seen some other farms nearby use that and sort of laying down uh, our cover crops right in the bed. Um, so that's, and I think I saw Frith Farm do that actually. So great farm. And that's where I think I got that, that idea from. Yeah, we use the, the flail mower on our bed tops and beyond having to drive a little bit on your bed tops, it's, um, it's great. It's such a great tool. I love that mower. Hey, you all just want to jump in here and give a shout out to a couple of our amazing sponsors like Never Sync Tools. Through March 27th, 2019, you can get the 10% off the Mutineer and its accessories or the Never Sync Flame Weeder at NeverSyncTools.com with the offer code NOTILL underscore COLT. That's all caps, no hyphen, NOTILL underscore COLT, C-U-L-T. I'll put that in the show notes as well. But can I just editorialize on these tools for a second? The Mutineer is such a genius design. If you have not seen it, basically imagine a collinear hoe that can become a wire weeder, that can become a torsion hoe in a matter of seconds, as you can interchange the tips for whatever job you are working on. It is quite literally every hoe you will ever need. The NeverSync Flame, for its part, is a lightweight and versatile flame weeder that can simply clamp onto the torch head of any standard size backpack flame weeder. 
Check them both out as well as some of the other tools NeverSync offers. Find them at NeverSyncTools.com. Offer code all caps, no till, underscore cult. All caps, no hyphen, no till, underscore cult. We'll put that in the show notes. The show is also brought to you by Banner Greenhouses. Banner is a family-owned certified organic flower and vegetable plant producer. This second-generation farm has been producing plant starts since 1991, and they are extremely good at it. In fact, this is a sponsor that my partner in NoTillGrowers.com, Jackson, and I specifically sought out because of how much we love their product and know you will too. I have some banner transplants in my garden as I speak. Their greenhouse is an outdoor growing area, cover 18 acres, and enable them to provide optimum growing conditions for each cultivar. Get CCOF certified organic vegetable and flower transplants delivered straight to your farm. It's as simple as creating an account, choosing a crop, and a desired plug size, then designating what week you want them to arrive. Whether you want to simplify your transplant production or don't yet have a prop house, get a better start with Banner Greenhouses. All right, back to Kyle. So with that much acreage is going to come a lot of management, I would assume. So what does that look like? Are you guys knee deep in spreadsheets? How do you keep track of your sort of crop plan? So this first season, uh, or this first, this entire year, um, I was, very overwhelmed with the size I thought I could handle and the size we began prepping. Um, but what we found was that as long as we had enough, so all of those blocks and beds were prepped, right? And so silage tarps were out on all of those we weren't using. And so we found that as long as we stayed up with keeping kind of blocks, you know, in the tube, so to speak, ready to go, it, the the nightmare of trying to figure out where the heck is this head lettuce going to go? We just filled that one up, and I still got ten flats. That that was manageable. Um, so, the, I guess the the one thing I should say is that when when I say seven acres, uh, three and a half of those acres were in active production where we flipped beds continuously, unending, on and on it goes. And geez, it. And here in Alabama, where we go 365 days a year, it does seem truly unending. But when we, the other three and a half acres we had in chickens. And so to manage that, it was allowing the cover crop to photosynthesize, create root structure down there that we won't mess up. Um, and then, um, so the, the biggest challenge there was just moving the chickens once a week or once every four days when they got, they got large. So we weren't thinking about that field, so to speak, as an active member in cultivation um, or in vegetable production. It was more uh, kind of a once a week, all right, where are the chickens going next? Well, we set it up so that the chickens could just kind of follow the, the paths of the blocks and they hit all 15 blocks there. Um, and, and actually, it will be really interesting to see because uh, of those cover cl- cover crop blocks this year, as an experiment, we did uh, 1,500 strawberry plants, um, and those strawberry plants went behind the you know a block that's been cover cropped for three or four months, had chickens move through, and then we gave it a healthy dose of compost. And so far, so good. Um, but in Alabama, at least where we're at, pests are insane. So we shall see how that does in our in our area. Yeah, sure. So with the strawberries, are you, and you have that little bit of background with a you pick, is that kind of the idea? Are you sort of trying to design a little bit of a you pick situation there? No, currently I don't know that that's um, in our, in our realm of capabilities because we are truly out in the middle of nowhere. We're an hour and a half from Birmingham. We're an hour from Tuscaloosa and I don't know where I heard this recently, but to give you any sense, we're a half an hour from Walmart. <laughs> like that's the <laughs> the telltale how 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 out there you are. Um, so our area is is not. I don't know that we would have the support for like an organic you pick, um, but for our CSA program, it's something that we is just a an incredible treat to add to that to the mix there. And so if those go till till end of May, June, we would be ecstatic for a, a first year experiment to build our beef up our boxes a bit. Oh yeah, man. People love strawberries in their CSA bath boxes. Yeah. 
Um, so with those three and a half acres that you had in uh, cover crop that were the where the chickens were, is that going to be the main garden next year? And then you're going to rest what you were on this year? No. Um, so the what our plans are now is uh, so part of the three and a half acres that was also in the chickens that has the strawberries that had the cover cropping. Um, we also on this farm, we grow some ancient grains. Um, one is purple straw wheat, which was uh, well known in the black belt in the 1700s. And um, it was almost lost. And I believe uh, it was like 1970 and Amish family had just enough to, to part off to someone. Well, we received a few tablespoons. So when someone connected to the farm received a few tablespoons of that seed. And then we received a little bit and we've grown that. So that's, that is there. Um, those ancient grains are there. Uh, we've also experimented with Carolina gold rice. Um, so some of that is in that field. Um, but we actually would like uh, to continue cover cropping part of that field. But some of that field, we're going to be expanding even more um, to meet some of the demand that we're projecting, um, some of the demand we think we'll have come come uh, April, starting in like, you know, March, April of this year. Uh, so that field will be kind of the active production. And then there's another three acres we would like to block out and have the chickens and cover cropping system move there. The cover crops are already up. So this time we're doing it a little different. The cover crops were already put there. And now we'll mow and form the blocks um, and put the chickens through like that um, and try to experiment with not pulling the beds at all and see how that does as opposed to what we've done previously. But um, so in answer to your question, I may have been may have went off on a rant there, but uh, that field will be used. So, it, you know, perhaps it'll be up to five acres of production. Um, we'll be adding another. Uh, 12 blocks to the mix for uh, 2019, uh, you know, April, May, March, 2019, spring of 2019. Wow. Okay. And then are you going to add labor as well? Yes, we have, uh, there's a horseshoe farms is, does incredible social work for some of the impoverished communities around us. Greensboro is one of those communities. Um, and we're creating a, a, a farm to, a, it's, called, it's called a farm health and nutrition program. And so this uh, Horseshoe Farms, they bring on uh, recent graduates, undergrad graduates, uh, before they go to med school or, you know, they, they go off to Ivy League school, prestigious schools. So they have this gap year. And those are the students that we're going to be bringing on another two full-time people um, that will be working part with the social work and, and part with us. So it's it's really adding another full-time uh, team member to our program. You know, all of us were 50, 60 hours a week, and that's we're adding another 50 hours between two people uh, to the team. So, And then, of, of course, volunteers. There's we're, We've got some ideas on some volunteer programs uh, that would more or less work for, for some free food. Nice. So – Getting back to that ancient grains and rice thing, are you all doing that on how is that being managed or is it kind of just a small hobby project or are you trying to do that for production? So for us, what we're doing, what we have uh, been challenged to do is build that seed stock. Um, so that seed stock would then be handed over to the larger farm with larger machinery uh, to, to possibly do that on a, on a bigger scale. And that farm, uh, that, a lot of that farm machinery is in place already uh, for the really cool system of the regenerative uh, animal side, which they use, um, they use cover cropping uh, for the animals. And that's, a, of course, a no-till system bringing the animals in. So we already have that uh, equipment in place. So we're just charged with uh, creating seed stock. Oh, okay, cool. So are you all certified organic? We are. Yep. USDA certified for about a year and a half now. Okay. And is there like, what are some of the things that you've learned? I mean, you have a lot of staff and then you have a lot of crop management to do. Like, what are some kind of things you've picked up in being able to manage that amount of land with that amount of crew? Um, yeah. Any, any, any insight into that would be interesting. 
Yeah, and I guess the biggest thing uh, was setting my goals a little farther than I even thought I could could jump to with assistance. Um, and that's just kind of a personality thing and maybe having that stress behind me that um, is always there and present. Uh, and and that with what I mean with that is, is I, I went out and I probably developed way too much land. But what I said earlier about not cultivating, I, I just can't stress enough how coming from other farms where I would cultivate for weeks at a time for th- half to three quarters of a day um, and then stop that for a week and plant and then do it all over again, only to find that the weeds were overgrown at the season, at the end of the season. Well, for us, we, we don't have that whole laborious, monotonous kind of just horrible non-money-making task is, is, I would say 85% to 90% gone for us. And so what we invested that time in was planting more. Um, and, and this is a very sincere shout out to Rose Creek Farms. Um, we found a way to do head lettuce in the summer. That's what started to all of a sudden things started to click. Uh, we had failures with tomatoes because our, our pest pressure is just insane here. And so we were fi- trying to find that thing, at least at the outset. A lot of those things are we're, we've gotten under control now. But at the outset, we were trying to find what crop was going to do well for us. And we found head lettuce and salad greens. We just rocked at those things. And so when that system fell into place, a lot of that extra time, we realized we were selling a whole bunch of this stuff in markets, to restaurants. Uh, CSA have loved having head lettuce year round. Um, that that's something I was you know worried that they were going to find kind of oh my god what are we having today oh more head lettuce but we haven't found that. Um, it's quite the quite the opposite. Uh, so I guess I guess the, to to answer that very simply is um, just as much as I pushed I I never could have realized that um, with the system we had in place that we would save labor in one place and then all of a sudden it opened the doors to do what um, we may not have been able to with with the the same amount of staff do if if we were tilling heavy or had that weed pressure like 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 I've seen. Yeah, sure. So what what are some of those head lettuce varieties? Are you growing muir and uh, Cherokee and what what are some of your head lettuce varieties that you're you're into? The ones we love are Starfighter, Muir, Muir is a, just a all year rock star. Um, Coastal Star Romaine. If you in a, if you are in a warm weather climate, I should say if you are in a disgustingly hot weather climate in the summer, Coastal Star Romaine. You know the whole system of just very briefly what we do there, which totally comes from Rose Creek. He had a post one day about using shade cloth, thirty percent to fifty percent shade cloth. So I was like, of course. And I bought the 50% shade cloth and we tried it and it worked. And we put the shade cloth, we planted the head lettuce, uh, Coastal Star, Muir, Tropicana, um, Starfighter. We planted all those from seedlings, put the shade cloth over for right at like 12 days, took it off and just had it watered once or twice a day, depending on the heat. And all of a sudden, we were growing some of the tastiest lettuce we've ever grown in a time of year that it shouldn't grow. Um, and that that was uh, revolutionary for our farm. A panisse is another amazing variety that is different from the, the aforementioned because uh, it's got the – it's just a different style of lettuce, a little bit, a little bit more buttery and um, – yeah. Nice. Are you also doing Salanova? Salanova, we have experimented with in the hot weather. It doesn't work for us. It's too bitter. Um, perhaps some menus with the way they dress it, that, that, that may not be an issue. But on the cooler months for us, oh, goodness, we grow the heck out of Salanova. That is our entire mix. We throw in a couple other different varieties, like a mini romaine, the green. We throw that in in that Salanova mix. And then... Uh, there's one more frilly one. I can't think of the name right now, but we, we also uh, cut that in the mix. And those are the Salanova for us is generally uh, two cuts. We pull it out, uh, you know, cut it, cut it below the soil line, 
throw it right in the walkway. Don't worry about, at least we don't worry about taking it off to another compost pile or anything. And then we just plant carrots that very same day. So very, very quick transformation there for us. Nice. So you mentioned summer lettuce and carrots. Uh, what are some of the other crops you all specialize in? Are you bothering with broccoli and sweet corn and those sorts of things? Or are you kind of letting other people do that? And how's that work, especially with your CSA? Yeah, for the CSA, what we have, um, you know, we always have a focus of diversity and not receiving the same box week after week, um, but keeping some of those really great ones. So carrots, I could, I cannot keep up with demand of carrots. And, and I'm telling you, the no-till system on those carrots are some of the sweetest we've ever had in our lives. And um, as a brick measurement to kind of to keep up with that, um, you know, to, to, I guess, proof of concept there, Bricks, which is a measure, I believe, of sucrose, but it's a measure of su- sugars in the in the greens. Or I actually think you can test the root as well. Anyways, we tested our um, our greens on the carrots, and they measured at 13 as a first. And this is six months after no till, so it's still very young, if not even negligible in in a, in a no till history. Um, and they tested at 13, and they're just incredibly sweet. And so that, that that is a testament to the no-till there. Um, but as far as where we specialize, I don't worry. Um, the fall broccolis for us are pest pressure. I, I know I keep saying that, but cucumber beetles here are just so numerous. We, we're finding them in the field in January in Alabama. Still to this day, cucumber beetles. They're not as active anymore, although they will kind of eat that the – glean on the on the head lettuce which can mean you lose a little bit having to continuously peel back but we are the the other pest pressure we have here is grasshoppers and so we 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 got destroyed every single um august planted august and september planted brassica was completely eaten to the ground by grasshoppers and so that was that oh crap moment of are we ever going to try this again no because what we can grow in its place is head lettuce, which, you know, for us, we can cover it with the, the bio, the bio thrip netting. Um, and then cucumber beetles don't, don't bother us at all. Um, so where else we specialize? Our arugula is really incredible in the, in the seasons that it, it doesn't really have a lot of flea beetle pressure. So that's kind of getting into May when we, when we stop that, although we are going to try and in some of our high tunnels um, to do to, to do some more exclusionary pest control methods. Uh, we don't spray anything at all on any of the crops except compost tea. And the, the compost tea for us has made a huge difference, um, not as some sort of, you know, ridiculous witch's brew um, that may or may not work for us. The cucumber beetles will not mess with those crops if that compost tea is sprayed on. Um, so we grow a lot of cucurbits, a whole, whole lot early and late season cucurbits. We have like seven plantings of cucurbits, um, and those do exceptionally well. We do things like potatoes. Sweet potatoes do incredible in our soil, which is crazy to think about being heavy clay soil. Um, yeah, I mean, 30 different varieties. And so I, I would say that head lettuce for us is really our, our biggest specialty. Yeah, it's such a great crop. Well, Kyle Platt. I really appreciate this conversation, man. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I really, really enjoyed it. And thank you very much for, for what you do. Um, you know, and uh, I was I was very, very attuned to Chris Blanchard's message. And uh, I just, I, I love what you're doing as, as a, another voice in the mix uh, to, to make it known um, different agricultural styles. Because I know for new farmers, it's, it can be very challenging sometimes to not just be able to Google a how-to. And, and I know um, podcasts for me have, have always been those aha moments. That, that, so thank you for what you do. All right, if you enjoyed that episode, make sure to follow Kyle on Instagram at Bodoc Farm. That is spelled Bois d'Arc. It's French, B-O-I-S space D apostrophe A-R-C. Yeah, the French are crazy. I'll leave some links in the show notes. 
Also, don't forget about our Patreon challenge. We need to get that up to $1,000 a month to afford a second season. So please consider signing up at patreon.com slash Farmer Jesse. I just put up a PDF on planting for your CSA. I add bonus videos from time to time. There are dis discounts for future events, which I swear will actually happen at some point. That's patreon.com slash Farmer Jesse. Thank you to our sponsors, Never Sink Tools, Banner Greenhouses, and Growing for Market. Other than that, you all, thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye. I know for us, personally, it was one of the hardest things was like finding more information about how to not till. It was like it's been so difficult to actually just get any information on it. Yeah. Just to hear, I heard, you know, Chris Blanchard, of course, like definitely a hero of mine. Um, I heard his singing frogs uh, <laughs> same, same, man. interview, and I was just like, Finally. Oh my gosh. I've been like, where have these people been? Yeah.